Okay, welcome to the exercise prescription and programming laboratory. Uh, this is more uh, Chris and I's field, so we, we should know this a little bit uh, better and uh, should be able to be a little more engaging. Uh, so the first principle we're going to talk about is the overload principle. And it's a very important principle uh, because what you need to understand is the body actually isn't getting better whilst we're training. Uh, we're creating a stimulus for the body to adapt to. So there's a common phrase that you'll hear people talking about where you want to stimulate, not annihilate. So what that means is we want to go to the gym and stimulate, say we're trying to increase muscle mass, we want to stimulate the body to adapt via increasing muscle mass rather than annihilate the muscle. And then what happens is it goes um, sort of you're overtraining and all it does is try and recover back uh, so you can think about it, say, a good example is skin. So if I keep rubbing my skin uh, with a certain level of uh, uh, pressure, over time my skin would toughen up. So if I did it for like an hour a day at a certain pressure, it would toughen up. But if I did it so strong that it ripped the skin and split open, all it would do was it would try and recover as quickly as possible and scab. Okay, so I haven't actually created the stimulus then to increase the, the thickness of my skin. So it's, it hasn't become tougher, it's just uh, in an alarm phase and it's trying to repair itself. So that's what I mean by annihilate. So if you go and train crazy hard, you're not necessarily creating the, per, uh, the uh, appropriate stimulus to get the adaptation that you want. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about muscle mass. When it comes to sport, it becomes even more important because if we just throw generalized uh, stimulus at Chris say, we're not actually necessarily going to get the improvement that we want. So we're, we're actually trying to stimulate exact changes uh, to improve, say he's trying to improve his vertical jump. We're only, we're stimulating that movement pattern via an increased load so that we improve that performance. Whereas if I just made him do, uh, say a wad, that's not necessarily going to make him jump higher. So it's very important that you understand that concept and that how we use over the overload principle to uh, create that adaptation to demand. Um, so we'll talk more about that throughout your degree as well. This is very much an introdu introductory uh, lecture to this concept. So we do this via manipulating different uh, components of the training. We'll show you a couple today. Uh, it's very much going to be strength based, but you can use these ideas for conditioning um, in all different sports. So if you're trying to get fitter and increase someone's VO2 max, you can think about these same concepts. Uh, but we're going to use the deadlift as our example today. So one of the ways we can uh, increase uh, or provide overload is by progressively, so it's very important that we do this progressively and incrementally and controlled, uh, we can increase the intensity. So when we're strength training, the intensity is the weight. Okay, so the actual weight that is lifted. So if we go in our program, Chris, we're gonna try and increase his deadlift. Uh, what I can do is say week one, he's gonna do uh, 40 kilos. So let's say we're, we're sticking to five reps. Yeah, Chris is happy to do five reps. So we're gonna stick to five reps for four weeks. Uh, so this is gonna be a block pattern and you can look up that more if you like. Generally, they're in four to six week blocks. Um, and we're going to incrementally increase the weight. So I'm going to get Chris to do week one. So five reps at 50 kilo, oh, 40 kilos. What are we going to do? Uh, we've got 50. Okay. We've got 50 kilos. So he's going to do uh, five reps at 50 kilos for the first week. So, you know, obviously this would depend on your client's uh, training history, which is their experience and how long they've trained. Uh, we're just starting off nice and light for Chris. Here. I'm sure we could lift a lot more weight than that. So then, week two, we, we, uh, we keep the reps the same. So we're gonna do five reps, but we're gonna uh, increase the intensity. So what we might do is just add, we might add some more ones, eh? Yeah, okay, uh, like 2.5 sides, and then we'll go to 55 kilos. So week two will be 55 kilos, and we can be even more incremental than that uh, with 1.25. So 
So we're going to progressively increase the intensity. Uh, so Chris will do five reps of this. So this would be week two. Again, you'd range in different sets and, and patterns like that for your client's experience. So Chris is going to conduct five reps. And then, so the block pattern, we're going to move into uh, week three. So we'll add another five, uh, two and a half a side. Um, we'll be up to 55, so we'll be at 60 kilos. So this is going to be his uh, overcompensation week. So we're creating the, the highest stimulus. And then the next week, we're going to have like a recovery week or a deload week, it's often referred to. But essentially, we're just going to have a lighter stimulus. So this week, the third week, is where we're creating that um, the stimulus to get the body to adapt. So again, week three now, so he's had seven days in between. He'll hit the five reps at 60 kilos. So they're very quick weeks. And then so the next week deload, uh, so it's not a full recovery, we still provide stimulus so that he doesn't uh, get reversibility and we'll talk about that in one of the next training principles. Um, so we still, he still comes to the gym and does uh, some exercise so that it's, we have some stimulus for him to adapt to but it's a lighter stimulus um, so that he can fully adapt to that heavy load. And this is very much going to be based on uh, your, your athlete, how much actual weight they lifted, so a, a you know, very strong uh, powerlifting, uh, like national champion sort of level, would need a very significant deload. Uh, whereas with Chris, uh, this isn't too heavy for him, so his deload pattern wouldn't have to go all the way down. So we'll just get him to do five reps at his original weight of 50 kilos. Okay, so you've just seen a month's worth of training for Chris, okay, very quickly. Then what we do is the next block, he would come in at a little bit higher. So his first week is, uh, was 50 kilos, he may come in with the first week at 52 kilos, depending on how he performed in that block. So if he, if he didn't manage to do the, you know, whatever we prescribed, three sets of five, um, in that third week, we essentially, uh, we probably maybe do that block again because he wasn't strong enough to progress. So it depends on the, the results and that's why we have to record these type of things. So this would be his first week of block two if we're doing four week blocks on deadlifts with a, a deload week. Uh, so the other option we can do uh, to change stimulus is we can modify volume. Do we want to decrease this for volume? Um, yeah. Yeah, so we can go to 40 kilos. We're being very friendly to Chris, so we'll make the 40 kilo bar. So with this uh, overload principle, we'll still use the four-week block principle because that's one of the, the easiest ways to do it, but now we're going to adjust volume. So he's going to stay at 40 kilos. We never want to increase two variables at once. So this time we're increasing volume, so the intensity will stay the same through the four weeks, but we're going to increase the reps. So Chris's first week is going to be five reps. So jump in Chris, week one. Yeah. 
So that's five. So then week two, we're going to bump it to seven. All right. We're not huge fans of high rep uh, deadlift, especially if it's heavy uh, when we prescribe programs, but we thought, Chris and I thought that deadlifts would be much better for you guys to see and understand the concept than say doing a bicep curl. Uh, so when we get up to week three, we're gonna do 10 reps. Uh, that wouldn't be necessarily how I would prescribe a deadlift very often. So Chris is gonna come in, ready for a seven rep up. All right, so week two, he's had seven days off, seven reps. stimulus uh, incrementally by increasing the reps so and you have got to be progressive with this as well so you wouldn't want to jack it from 5 10 and 15 but so you notice we only added two reps there uh, so the next one we'll do once he's ready for it we'll do nine reps um, and that's our super compensation week or we're trying to create that higher stimulus so are you ready to go Chris will come in and do nine reps. So nine rep deadlift is not often a, a fun thing to do. His, his biggest week of the block, you know, have, you've got to home do some recovery and we'll talk about recovery more. And then the next week will be a uh, deload week. So we won't, we'll drop the volume back down. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go down to week one. So we could do say six reps, but for the sake of saving Chris for tonight, his deload week will be three reps. So we're going to give him a little bit of stimulus so that he doesn't completely reverse but it's just like a maintenance week. We're just trying to maintain what he already has. Uh, we've given him the stimulus to adapt to in this week, and week four, we're just trying to maintain the three weeks we've built up to, so that when we come back to the next block, we could potentially do it at, uh, say, 42 kilos, so maybe 1.25 each, each. Uh, depending again on how we perform through this. So if the volume, he managed to do the nine reps with good technique. So remember, we're always worried about good technique as well. So we'll just make Chris do three weeks, uh, three reps. This is week four. Three. That's good. So we've created overload stimulus whilst he's training done some muscle damage, he goes home and the muscles recover, the neural system learns how to do the, the correct technique, uh, and then the next next block, he should be stronger. Well, this one, he may have a little more endurance as well because we're increasing volume. So there's two methods of uh, increasing overload. Other ways that we can uh, play around with it is uh, frequency. So maybe the next block, uh, we may uh, make him do two deadlift sessions a week rather than one. So that would be a way that we can manipulate overload. Uh, another one that we can do is we can change the type. So uh, something similar, but it's a new stimulus. So say Chris has done two years of deadlifting, um, we may need to change the exercise for him. So we could potentially do an RDL. So uh, most guys in this course might have seen this. So it's a Romanian deadlift, and he's just doing essentially a reverse pattern of the deadlift. Okay, so that's a, that's a change in type. We've talked about changing frequency, intensity, type, and time essentially is uh, volume, uh, but we can do other things as well, like making sessions longer. Um, but that's our fit principle. So I've actually covered the fit principle within the overload. So you're gonna keep those things in the back of your head. We don't wanna stimulate, I mean, we don't wanna annihilate, we wanna just stimulate uh, adaptation, and then we do that via fit principle, frequency, intensity, type, and time, and that all fits within the uh, overload principle.
Okay, so the next principle we're going to discuss is this, the principle of specificity. Uh, and it ties in very nicely with the overload principle because um, I, I've already talked about we're, we're trying to create adaptation and we, we create little stimuluses that increase over time. We also need to ensure that that stimulus is relevant for what we want to achieve. Um, and in the next principle, we'll be talking about individualization. So we're going to talk about whether it's relevant for that person. Uh, so we're going to talk about this in the context of a sport and we'll talk about it uh, very much in the context of a strength type training session, but the, this principle uh, is relevant for cardiovascular training and all that kind of stuff as well. So accuracy, uh, all those other sports, but we're going to stick because we're in a gym environment, we'll stick to the strength training uh, side of things. So there's a, there's a principle, uh, part of the specificity principle, we can think, talk about uh, the set principle, which is specific adaptation to imposed demand. So the body will adapt specifically to what we, uh, what stimulus we're given. So the more and more down my path of studies within the sport and exercise field, the more and more I uh, really, really think specificity is key. So some examples of this is, um, well, the big one first that you guys will learn is energy systems. So we have three uh, energy systems and they all are dominant in different time periods and intensities of exercise. So if we have somebody who is, say, a 100 meter sprinter, then they're gonna have a very, very highly developed uh, ATP creatine phosphate system. And don't worry if you don't know those words yet, you'll learn those in later courses, but that's the first energy system that provides energy very rapidly for very high intensity exercises. Uh, so we're gonna, if we're trying to train somebody for an event like that, so weightlifting, sprinting, uh, maybe gymnastics, depending on what event they are in, uh, anything sort of within that one to 10 second range, we really need to develop that. So if we take that athlete and go do 10 kilometer running, uh, we're not actually providing the stimulus that will improve that person's uh, capability in the sport and sometimes we actually might reduce their capability so not everything is complementary um, especially with things like strength and power with endurance training uh, so it gets very complicated there so uh, strength training athletes don't benefit from endurance training uh, quite often that, that actually might impact their ability to get as strong as possible but on the other hand endurance trainers get endurance training um, endurance athletes get a lot of benefit from strength training. So it, it depends on the sport and it's not always uh, consistent. So there's a lot of things to think about there. So energy systems is one, speed of movement. So a lot of uh, uh, power is through speed and a lot of that comes through the neuromuscular system. So how fast the body can send the signal to the muscles to do what you want them to do. So it's a little bit of motor patterning and neural, neural adaptation and uh, fiber type, which you guys will go into more in your degrees. But if we train things that aren't uh, increasing that speed, then we won't necessarily improve this athlete's performance. Uh, there's other things as well. So I mentioned the fiber type. We have, um, you guys at this level sort of need to know that there's a slow twitch and fast twitch. So slow twitch suits more endurance type activities and fast twitch is more for the stuff that I've been discussing. So sprinting, throwing, powerful events. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit more to that. It's a bit more of a spectrum, but we'll teach you more about it, of that in exercise physiology. So it needs to be fiber type specific, energy system specific, movement specific. So it should, uh, to a certain extent, look like the movement that we're trying to achieve. Uh, and again, you'll learn a bit more about that in the case because sometimes if we, um, you're going to be treated with caution because if it looks exactly or close to the movement but it actually changes a little bit, sometimes we can get a negative transfer. Uh, so generally I try and use the same uh, movement pattern but I don't make it look exactly the same. A good example of that, and I'll use boxing for a few examples tonight, is if I'm a boxer and I'm carrying a five, six kilo weight, Good boxing technique, the, the fist leaves the chin straight out, the power's coming through the leg and the hip. If I start training my boxer with five or six kilos in their hand and they start dropping their hand to throw because of that extra weight, we actually might decrease that boxer's performance, even though it looks like that and we feel like it's specific.
Okay, so uh, you've got to be careful, but um, the example I'll use will continue with boxing because uh, there are exercises that would be more suitable than others. Uh, the other ones, and this is getting a little bit more advanced, but muscle uh, adaptation, it can actually change its angles a little bit, so we call it muscle architecture. So to make the, the body more efficient and stronger. And then you also get adaptation to things like ligaments and bones, to name a few of the things that add out, adapt to stimulus specifically. So we've got to be very, very structured and uh, planned if we're trying to create, especially in the athletic world, uh, a specific adaptation. So if we're trying to improve somebody's top end speed, we need to be training at top end speed or close to in the, the event that they do, so say it's running. So sprint, uh, swim training at top end speed won't help improve somebody's uh, running sprint at top end speed. And you may have felt this before, say you've done a lot of running and then you go do, say something like a boxing session or a weight session and you feel like you're really, really unfit, that's because of the law of specificity. Your body's adapted to that and become very good at that thing that you've been training them with. Um, essentially, it's like a machine. So the example we're going to use with Chris today is let's talk about, um, let's say boxers and we'll also talk about uh, sort of rugby athletes or uh, rugby union, American football type athletes. So we we'll use the, the same exercises for those guys. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is bench press versus landline press. So uh, for those who don't know those exercises, we'll start with the bench press. We haven't set him up in a, in a proper bench press for the sake of filming. But if I hand this to Chris, this is what a bench press looks like. Yeah, nice and controlled. He'll just do two reps for you there. I'll take that away from him. And a landmine press. So we'll show you a landmine press. Just two reps is fine there. Yeah. So as you can uh, you see, if I do that standing, the bench press will look like this. Okay, and the landmine press looks like this. So you can see, probably realize where I'm going with this, where the landmine press is probably going to be more suitable for those two activities. So boxing and rugby, because we can make the landmine press look like a fend. Uh, and we can make the landmine press look like a punch. So if I get Chris to jump back on the landmine, what we could even do is make it even more specific. So for our boxing athlete, I can actually get Chris to release the landmine, uh, the landmine or the barbell. So he'll throw it. I can catch and give it to him. Okay. So now it's a, a very similar exercise. One more. Okay, so he's got power in there. Or what we could do is really load it up and he can put a little bit of power on it, but he doesn't let go. So I give us just a second, put 30, 40 kilos on there. And boom. All right, now we're looking probably a little bit more like something a rugby athlete would want to do. So you can see how we're a little bit more movement specific here, but then I also adjusted the, the speed of movement and we changed the load as well. So these, these are within the, the field or the the principle of specificity. It needs to be uh, specific in movement pattern, energy system, muscle fiber type, speed, to name a few. It's a very important training principle. Okay, so the next principle we're going to talk about is the principle of individualization. Uh, this is also a very, well, they're all very important principles, so you need to stick to them all and have them all in the back of your mind whilst you're running programs, whether it be strength training, cardiovascular training, uh, high intensity interval training. You need to have these principles, uh, concrete cement in the back of your head, you know them like, uh, like you know the back of your hand. So individualization is very important because uh, Chris and I will adapt very differently to the, the, say the deadlift stimulus and you will adapt very differently too. We also need to do things like change techniques for different individuals. Uh, so the main point or the take home from this section is to, you can't just do cookie cutter programs. You can't just give everybody the same program and expect everybody to, to adapt the same. 
Uh, a, a, I'll give you some examples of different reasons why. Uh, so they will include um, body composition. So somebody who has relatively more muscle mass uh, may, well, uh, percentage-wise or relatively, might be able to lift more weight or more reps. Uh, so generally, uh, muscle cross-sectional area, so size will be linked to strength, and then that percentage-wise of that, will, you know, they might be able to do more reps than somebody of that weight. Um, and then so relatively as well, we can, we can adapt it for uh, our fat-free mass, so we could, I could make it per kilo, and even then, Chris may be able to lift more weight than I can at that relative load because we're just different athletes. Uh, somebody who has much more fat mass, so to say an obese client, uh, something like walking on a treadmill at six kilometers an hour might be a maximum stimulus for them. So you always have to have that in your back of your mind because they are carrying a lot more weight around and that's very common now as trainers to experience that or have somebody you know, to train like that. Uh, fiber types, so we've touched on that and you know, this is very much introductory to this, but uh, Chris may have 70% slow twitch fibers, 30% fast twitch, so he'd be very, very good at running 10 kilometers, and I might be 70% fast twitch, 30% uh, slow twitch, so I'm going to be very poor at running 10 kilometers, but I may adapt well and be able to lift more weight or run faster. So those two, and that's a generally that's a genetic trait, so you're born with what you get, and you can make slight adaptations to how those uh, fiber types um, uh, metabolically are but essentially that's pretty set. Most people are around 50-50, but you know, it's, it's, you know, the elite sprinters would probably be on the 70-30 side and the elite cardio uh, 10 kilometer runners would be on that side. They sort of get distributed into the sports that they're gonna be very, very good at. Uh, so fiber types important and we can't measure that um, unless we do like a, a puncture and we take a full sample out of the muscle, so you know, that's not often done. But you can quite often see it with things like the vertical jump test that we did. Uh, and if you're in my class, I said they look more springy. So if somebody that's springy and has that power, quite often you can probably predict that they have a lot of the fast twitch type fibers. Uh, adaptability, so this is a very interesting part. Uh, our concept is uh, some people adapt really well to stimulus and some uh, average adapters and then they're even um, they call them non-responders. So uh, you could get a subject A and we could make him run on a treadmill for 10 kilometers uh, three times a week for 12 weeks and his VO2 max may not even change. So that's quite possible to happen. It's, it's uh, you know, a lower percentage of the population, but there are people who don't respond to certain stimulus. Uh, you see the same thing sometimes in gyms with a young guy who is very consistent, uh, three or four times a week lifting weights and his weight, his muscle doesn't increase. He's doing the perfect things, diet, weight wise, strength, and he just doesn't have the, the genetics, fiber type, uh, muscle ratio to actually gain muscle. So he would be a non-responder to muscle training. Uh, so he might be a responder to cardio training, so you're not a non-responder to everything, but um, it's very important that you uh, track and measure people because you, you know, there's, there's the opposite end of the spectrum too where one person can do one a week and get heaps of muscle gains uh, and then if you're trying to maintain their weight, say for a boxing where they need to be 80 kilos, you might have to program one weight session every two weeks. So individualization is very important. Range of movement, so we're gonna, we're gonna do a couple of uh, range of movement, uh, movement screens tonight. So we'll do three of those just to show you uh, where that goes because that's one that I can show you on film. Um, so we, we look at each individual's flexibility characteristics and then some exercises may or may not suit them. So that's a, a very important uh, thing to look at and then we may have to increase their range of movement in particular joints for that person to uh, be able to uh, proficiently squat, for example. So to say maybe their uh, ankle dorsiflexion, which is this movement pattern, uh, they don't have the required range of movement to squat correctly. Uh, with that as well, things like uh, joint lengths, so my ratio, so my lower leg to my upper leg ratio, so my tibia to femur ratio, that may be different, so if my femur is really long, that means when I squat, 
I will sit back further and my torso will lean forward compared to somebody who has a more even ratio or the ratio the other way around. So, um, you know, that would have implications on how we train them, how much load we train them and their, their, uh, the risk that they're exposed to, to injury. Uh, there's, there's large differences in ge uh, gender and how they adapt uh, and we'll go into that more later on. Things like nutritional status, uh, so how well fed your athlete is, if, they get, if they're getting enough protein, iron, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you also got to consider job life stresses, so somebody who's very stressed may not need a very stressful stimulus um, in the program that you wrote for them because they're already high stress, so you might give them lower intensity exercise um, because you, you're trying to reduce their cortisol and stress. Uh, and then another big one is, what is this person's goals? So uh, through my experience in the industry, you'll see a lot of trainers and exercise physiologists training people with things that I want to train him with. But if he wants to be uh, participate in the next marathon, but I like deadlift, deadlift isn't going to make him run well in the next marathon. Uh, but you do see that, so it's very important that you, even ignoring some of the other stuff that I've talked about, if this guy might be a non-responder non to a cardio exercise, but he wants to be a marathon runner, we still need to try and increase his cardiovascular endurance. So those things are very important. So take home message, no cookie cutter programs. We're gonna write programs for this person and their goals. So things that we can do, we can do fitness screening and we're gonna show you a sub-maximal test in one of the shoots later on that uh, you can use in gyms with new clients to see where their fitness level is at. Um, these kind of screening techniques as well, they're good to see uh, the progression of your client too. So it's important to measure things because, because we can't uh, monitor and adjust if we haven't measured anything. So the first thing we're gonna show you tonight and in exercise prescription programming one, we'll go into this more uh, thoroughly, but we're gonna show you a very, uh, po uh, a very popular screening modality, which is the functional movement screen. And if you're interested, if you just search functional movement screen, you'll see the full um, screening repertoire. We're just gonna throw, show you three exercises tonight. So the first one we're gonna do, so you get a little kit for the functional movement screen. Um, and what we'll do, we'll get our client Chris here, and he's, the first one he's gonna do is the deep squat test. And there's a whole system here of how we deal with uh, the, the results from this test. You'll learn that later on. So when we're setting up for the deep squat test, what we have to do, we have a specific criteria um, that he has to stick to. So the next time we test him, he would be in the exact same position. And uh, if somebody else tested him who wasn't me, they would be able to get him in the exact same position again. So with the deep squat test, we have feet facing directly forward. The, feet, the inside of the foot has to be in line with the armpit. So we just do it like that. Okay, and then if I go to the other side, like this. Okay, then what we do is we pop this on the head. I'll get Chris to do it because he wouldn't mind hurting his head. Uh, and he has to create 90 degree bends here. So that's fine there. So that's how we can standardize the test that way. Then what we do, arm straight up. So with the FMS, and there's many movement screens, this is just one. The FMS dictates that it doesn't actually get that many um, points or, or cues. So essentially I'll just say to Chris, uh, what we're going to do is travel down into a nice deep squat as far as you can, can control, uh, pause, at, pause at the bottom for a second, and try and maintain your arms overhead. That's it, isn't it? Yes. So that's as, as much as we tell him. And then Chris will go down. So our client gets, and he can come up. So he's really pushed the limits there. I would actually give him a three there. So it's a one, two, three score for the uh, FMS screen. But say in three attempts, he didn't get a two, uh, a three. So things like, uh, that don't give him a three is if the, the stick travels forward, like he's got there. If his knees collapse in, um, what else is the criteria? I don't get to depth. He doesn't get to depth is another big one as well. So there's a whole criteria and we'll, we'll introduce you to that. So say he didn't get a three, um, but his shoulders have become very mobile now, so you can do it. <laughs> Then what we do is we take the three off the table. So he's definitely not a three. 
So we go, all right, can you do it with a compensation? So we lift the heel. So the heel lift shifts his weight forward a little bit and it sort of acts like he's got more dorsiflexion, that, that movement of the ankle that I talked about before. And then what we do is say, all right, Chris, give us the same, same cues and we measure him up again. And if he did that correctly, so his torso is upright. Uh, the other one that I didn't talk about is here, say that's his lower leg. You can come back up there, Chris. If that's his lower leg, his torso has to be either parallel or more vertical. So that's the other criteria you look for. So if Chris could achieve it there, then what we'd say is, okay, Chris, you've got a two. Um, so it's a very basic system. Zero means pain, so if you're experiencing pain. So it would be a zero. One's that he can't do it at all, so even with the compensation. Two's with compensation, which is the heel lift. And three is perfect according to the criteria. So that's the deep squat screen. I get a two, so I might jump in quickly and show you from a side angle. So just quickly, I'm just going to drop down. This angle here, not the same as this angle here. I'm going to dow this pitch forward over the feet. So you can see Chris would give me a two there. If I do a heel lift, hopefully I get a two. Pop it up. You can see where the dow is positioned over the feet. This, this angle is the same as that angle now. That's a, that's a two, sorry. So, already by that, we've got to program Chris and I strength training differently. Uh, I need to work on my dorsiflexions more, where Chris, his deep squat was good, we would allow him to do squat pattern exercises. So I need work, Chris is good to squat. Uh, the next one we're gonna do, active straightening raise. So Chris lays down, so knees are underneath the, the bar, and it's laying flat. What we do, and you guys will learn this in anatomy, we go off into ASIS, which is the front of his pelvis, as, as it rolls around and goes flat. Uh, so see, if you want to look it up, it's the anterior superior iliac spine, and his mid knee, what we do, right, if you did it, I'll show you the cheat that I do, but um, to do it correctly, we go there, uh, 54, so we go 24, 27. So we're there. Okay, and then we put the stick up here. Okay, my cheat that I mentioned is I'll just find those points and then find the middle through using my fingers. That's assuming that my fingers are the same. Okay, so for the active straight leg raise, you have to cue that um, this leg has to stay down, this one has to stay dead straight. So any knee bend is a compensation. So we say keep your heel, your toes up, and lift your leg as far as you can. So we'll do the left leg as far as you can, nice and controlled. What we're looking for is the little bumps inside of his ankles, how far that goes. So this one's called the lateral malleolus. So if Chris goes down and recover, relaxes. So for Chris to get a three, there has to be no compensation. So that right leg can't, the knee can't lift. So if Chris shows the knee lift on the right leg. So if it's nice, yeah, the knee pops up. So sometimes you just see it pop up like that or the foot rotates out. So those are the kind of compensations you'll see. Um, so for him to get a three, his malleolus, so the little bump that I talked about, has to go past the bar, so this way. So with a dead straight leg, malleolus passed, we give him a three there. Um, if he gets to here, so between the knee and the pole would be a two, and then uh, a one is below that knee level. So that malleolus is past the knee, so that would be a one if he could only get there. Um, they get three attempts, you're allowed to only give them a few cues. One of them usually is can you keep your dead, uh, leg dead straight because everybody always tries to push past here and they'll do things like pop their knee, bend their knee a little here or kick out to try and get there because everybody seems to be a little competitive when they do this one. So already Chris has got a three there. I'm pretty sure I get a three there as well so I won't bother showing you uh, my score there. But uh, if somebody had a one on that, we wouldn't be rushing to give them a hair, uh, like something like a deadlift as an exercise. They wouldn't have the prerequisite range of movement. Um, so again, their program for Chris at a three would look different to somebody with a one on the active straight leg raise. Uh, and the last one we're going to show you is the shoulder mobility screen. So what we do is we make it relative to our subject, so we don't have just a set absolute measure. We measure from the crease at the bottom of his hand 
to the length of the middle finger. So we go there to there. So Chris has got 20 centimeters there. Okay, so then what we do, if Chris faces this way, so you can see, the thumb has to wrap inside and we instruct our uh, client or patient to go one hand over and reach for the back and the other hand to go under. Now, they're not allowed to reach any further after they um, put it down. So you can't have this sort of like wiggling down if Chris tried to like try and go a little further. So you can't try for any further. It's where they first land. Then what we do, so Chris goes again. So within one hand length is considered a three. So we go from the closest points and he's got about a 13 in there. So he gets a three. And then if he goes the other side. So for the recording purposes, we go off the, so this would be a left arm test. But we're actually testing the range of movement for both arms. And then if I went here to the closest points, we're at 16, so he'll get a three again. So he's got three and three, but I'd also take note that that other side wasn't as far. What did I say that one was? That's 13. 13. So 13 and 16. So I'll take a note of that slight difference. Um, but Chris's ankle uh, shoulder range of movement allows him to do things that are overhead. So say shoulder press. If somebody doesn't have great shoulder mobility, we shouldn't load them overhead in something like a shoulder press because we'll start seeing compensation patterns where they'll jack up through here and push the head forward. So this was just one example of individualization. We can do other tests to test uh, for uh, whether the technique's gonna suit them, how their force profile is. Um, you know, if we, get, we can do invasive tests like measuring their uh, fiber type. But this is one that you should generally always start with whenever you're training someone in some sort of range of movement, movement screen. Um, so that's individualization. Okay, so the last training principle we're going to talk about is recovery. So remember in my, uh, I think it was in the overload section, I was talking a lot about uh, we don't uh, become better during the training session. That's when we're providing the stimulus. So now the recovery is when the repair happens. And when the repair happens, say it's something like muscle fibers, that's when we'll add, the, the body will add more muscle fibers. And that will happen generally whilst you're sleeping. So, uh, Recoverability is uh, very important, and there's things that we can do to help it, and there's things that we can do to decrease it. But if we don't recover from the stimulus, then we are likely to, well, at best case, we get uh, no benefit from the training session. Worst case is you set yourself up for injury because you haven't recovered from the last session. So you're bringing in the stress uh, stimulus from that session into the next session. So maybe the micro, fiber te uh, micro tears in the muscle fiber, uh, and then you've gone with something heavier and then you may tear it because it's not in full capacity again. So recovery is very important. Uh, so if you can take home that uh, the, the stimulus and the, the muscle growth or whatever you're trying to achieve isn't happening whilst you're training, it's happening in this period, uh, then you're steps and levels ahead of the general training population. So the big three in recovery, uh, hydration, nutrition, and sleep, okay? If you got those right, uh, then you are gonna recover most of the time and you're gonna be doing really well. The rest of the stuff is just additions, um, and I'll talk about those as well. But uh, sleep, so generally you know, the people tell you that you need eight hours sleep a night, but if you're doing heavy resistance training, high volume endurance training, stuff like that, you may actually need more sleep. So if you're in heavy training blocks, you may be looking at uh, nine, 10 hours of sleep, uh, even more, depending on how much training you're doing. So sleep is very, very important. That's when your body repairs. Nutrition, so are you getting enough carbohydrates and are you getting enough protein? And are the main two key ones for training adaptations, but then you also need the fat for the neural adaptations and a lot of other things as well. So fats are uh, very much good for us, but when it's pure performance stuff, we're, we're generally thinking carbs and protein. Uh, one of the funniest things about uh, nutrition and sort of the bro science stuff is the bodybuilders are really, really obsessed with protein when uh, the protein is actually quite easy to achieve the amount that they require and they don't think about carbs enough, but really carbs and that extra energy through carbohydrate is how we get those uh, large gains in muscle mass. So when you're looking for something like bodybuilding type gains, 
um, the carbon budget really is key to that kind of growth. Whereas on the other hand, the endurance guys are obsessed and, and always thinking about carbohydrates, but they're actually creating much more muscle damage with each training session than an experienced bodybuilder. So they need uh, to really focus on carbohydrates still, but protein. Uh, and quite often those guys aren't as focused on protein, they're always thinking about carbohydrate. Both sports, they're both important macronutrients, they're important macronutrients for everyone. It's just interesting the focus um, and the guys that uh, focus on protein probably should think about carbohydrate more, and the guys that focus on uh, carbohydrate should be thinking about their protein more. And we'll go more and more into that with uh, things like your sports nutrition courses with Gary Slater. Um, but nutrition is very important, sleep's very important, and you guys should know that hydration is very important as well. The cell needs hydration to operate correctly. Uh, a couple extra other ones. So if the training session causes significant uh, inflammation, so say like at a rugby training session, uh, things like ice baths can improve the recovery from that session. So it's very similar to uh, things like when you've when you've done an injury and you're trying to reduce the swelling. Uh, in saying that, some stimulus that we create, like resistance training stimulus, we actually want that process to occur to create adaptation. So the ice bath wouldn't be so beneficial for somebody who's just finished a strength, a strength training session, but it would be very beneficial for who, someone who's just done rugby training, netball training, you know, those actual sport-based training sessions that cause that kind of uh, strain on the body and it's maybe some bruising and damage like that. Uh, massage and rolling has been shown to help. Uh, stretching after training has been very good and uh, increasing mobility so the, the tissues are more pliable in that period of time. Uh, things like moderating your stress, so you've got to remember that exercise and, and training are a stressor. So if you're accumulating the stress from exercise on top of life stress, you're not going to recover as well. So that's the thing, things like yoga, meditation, uh, tai Chi, those things have been shown to help with recoverability as well. Compression garments is very similar to the ice bath concept. Uh, and then you, the things like active recovery, so going on the next day after training, things like walking, swimming, uh, sessions like that. So you see the AFL guys in Melbourne, uh, you know, waist high and really cold water. Um, so they're getting sort of two things there, they're actively moving with the ice bath as well. So active is very important as well, get the body moving again, but at a very low intensity. So uh, it's very important as somebody who is training athletes that you've got recovery planned, because quite often in their head, they're thinking if I train harder, I will be, be better. But you as sports scientists or strength and conditioning coaches or wherever you, wherever you end up, you know better because you know that the adaptations that occur during the recovery phase, so you need to prioritize it and you need to get buy-in from your client, athlete, patient. The recovery is important and that they need to be looking after these things and looking after themselves.